Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. I know I'm gonna stir the pot with this. Eight tools that I would never buy again, and I'm gonna suggest you not buy them. Now, let's drop the gloves and get started. I can't wait to read the comments on this. So where'd this come from? Well, remember, it's my opinion for what that's worth. But I, like everybody else, started out, bought tools that I came to find out afterwards I didn't need or they didn't work or they were not suited. Now, I've got a fair bit of experience. I've been working wood for over 700 years. So what I want to do is go through and not only tell you what not to buy, but I want to tell you why not to buy it. And I'm going to offer you, I'll suggest, or I'm going to offer you an alternative that I think would be better suited. A lot of this advice has come from people that are just offering their opinion, but sometimes those opinions come across as being the gospel when really it's an opinion. And remember, it's my opinion. If you've got a bit of experience behind it, then that carries a little more weight, but when it boils down to it, it's just an opinion. Anyway, you might want to get your notepad out and your pencil. Let's start. So if you're going to woodwork, everybody wants a hand plane, and as you migrate toward hand tools, of course you're going to need a hand plane. And there's lots of advice out there, but I find that most of it is pushing people towards fours, fives, even threes. And I'm gonna suggest why you might wanna not consider those and I will give you the option. This is actually my first ever plane. This came from my grandfather. It's a number three, but if you see, and I wear a, a large glove, so if you're a person that would wear a glove larger, or bigger, you're gonna have a very difficult time cramping your hand down inside there. Now it's designed to be a three finger grip with your index finger going down along the side or out here and that's just uncomfortable. And the, the uh, four is not much better. These are smoothers, and their purpose is dictated by their length. A short sole will go in and make the surface smooth without necessarily flattening it or being affected by the areas surrounding the area that you're working. Unlike a longer plane, which you're gonna have to surface a much bigger area to get down to a specific spot. My suggestion would be the four and a half. It's approximately the same length. There's only maybe a half an inch difference, three quarters at the most, so it doesn't change its function. It's a lot wider. You're talking about inch and three quarter, two inch versus two and three eighths. And some people may say, well, that's going to be a lot harder to push. If you learn how to sharpen properly, you won't notice any difference in the three of them in terms of how wide of a shaving you're taking. I have a video called 32 Seconds of Sharp. Very simple, very basic. We'll leave a link below to help you. But look at my hand on this one. Far more comfortable. This is the one I would prefer if I, had to, if I wanted to use a smoother. Now, one other thing to consider is, is this, the footprint. Here you have a plane that is relatively narrow, which means it's not as stable in use. This one is much wider, much more stable in use. And I actually could throw a third thing in, and that is the weight. You'll find that pushing a plane through the wood, the heavier it is, the easier and more smoother it is to operate. Whereas these lighter planes, a little bit what you might call jerky. So if you're looking for a smoother, leave these ones for the adolescents. An adult smoother, I consider to be a four and a half. The next, staying on the line of um, tools being planes, this is a low angle jack. It's a remake of it originally done as a number 62 by Stanley. Uh, there's not very many of them around because they didn't last very long, meaning they didn't produce them very long because they weren't terribly popular. Now, I don't like this plane at all. I don't like the fact that the adjuster knob is down underneath. It's very, I find it very awkward to move. I use my jack on my shooting board a lot. And while a lot of folks talk about this being great because of the low angle approach, a, I'm going to show you that the approach, really, the angle of attack really isn't that much different. But more importantly is you just don't have a lot of surface area. If you compare that to say the five and a half, which I think is a far better plane, there's a lot more surface area for stability on the shooting board. Not only that, there's a lot more weight. When you're using your shooting board, you want that weight and to help carry that plane through that end grain cut. Now, the angle of attack. On a bench plane, if you remove the lever cap and examine the angle that you're actually planing the wood, the frog is 45 degrees. 
that means you're planing wood at 45 degrees. The bevels are underneath, so they don't matter. They don't come into account at all in factoring what angle are you meeting the wood. On a low angle jack, the bevel is on the top side. So if you remove the lever cap and look at this, you have your bedding angle of 12 degrees. You've got your primary bevel, which is 25. That gets you to 37. Almost everybody avoids having to polish all of this and introduces what we call micro bevels. I typically add somewhere between five and seven. So if you add, if you add um, 37 plus five, you're up around 42. Well, 42 versus 45, three degrees, really isn't that big of a deal. It's far more important how sharp it is. And if it's really sharp, the way I like to do it, you're never gonna notice three degrees difference. So would I choose a, a low angle jack? Never. Don't like them at all. Remember, that's just my opinion. There are those that argue that, well, you can get different blades at different angles. I'll find a better way to do it. Really don't like this plane. My favorite, and I would say thanks to David Charlesworth for making me think about it, is the five and a half. I do almost everything with it. It has the mass, it has the length, that means it's still a good smoother, even though it's longer than most, but it is, and it's smaller than a jointer, so it's not gonna work, function as a jointer, but for a general purpose, and including the shooting board, I don't think you can beat it. Consider the five and a half. Next is a standard angle block plane. So stand, by standard angle, what that means is the bedding angle, that's the angle that the blade actually sits on, is, 20 degrees and because you see you tell this doesn't get used with the bet with the bevel on the top side again you factor that in so you've got 20 degrees plus 25 which is 45 degrees and again if you add in some micro bevels you could be planing as high as 50 degrees not that that's a huge issue but the biggest problem is this because that puts the lever cap so high when you're holding on to it, your hand is more on top as opposed to behind. And I just find that's very awkward the way that nestles, I wouldn't say nestles either, the way that positions in your palm, you're up here, just not very comfortable at all. The low angle block has a bedding angle of 12 degrees. So you're planing, when you factor in all of your micro bevels, you're probably in the mid, four, low 40s, but with that being sitting down there so much lower, and by the way, you can easily add another blade with a higher angle on there, and that'll change your pitch. So if you want a higher angle of attack, meaning the planing angle, you can easily do it. The big advantage is because this distance is so much smaller, that fits in your hand a whole lot better. It actually positions it so that you're behind the blade pushing. I find this a whole lot more comfortable you put them side by side, you can see what I mean. So if you're gonna get a block plane, get a low angle block plane. You can alter the angles with the blade, but you'll find that a lot more comfortable in your hand. Not be an issue. This is the original shooting board plane. This was a Stanley number 51. It actually had a, uh, a cast iron table for it, but you could use it like this. And the idea was that the blade was on a bit of an angle. The, my only complaint, or my biggest complaint, is it was a single purpose plane. That means you had to have a place for your shooting board, and this plane, as opposed to using one of your bench planes, that you could easily use general purpose on the bench. I also don't like the fact that the blade is here, my handle's back here. I find a lot more control if my hand is right up there near the blade. And it's expensive. The ver versions today are at least $500 each. If you have it and you don't mind spending it, I suppose. But I'm going to give you a little shameless promotion. This is something we just came out with. It's called the grip. It's designed to fit on there. Now, your hand is right here where the blade is. It's, a, it's very easy and, and gives you great control. It's easy to put on and off. So you can turn your main bench plane into an effective shooting board plane with just a couple of seconds. So if you want to save some money, and some space, which is the biggest concern I have, trade your, or trade your idea of getting a designated shooting board plane for a good five and a half and add the grip and you find, may find far better suited. 
And what I, what I would uh, never buy again is a mortise chisel that does not have parallel sides. Or if the sides are parallel, they have to be square to the bottom. And I'm going to show you why. But here's one that, has, that is not square. If you go on the other side, the side, these sides are parallel, but they're not square to the bottom. I'll show you how that's problematic. And here's one where both sides are slanted in. So it's narrower at the top than at the bottom. And I don't know why people do that because... Well, when I show you, you'll see what I mean. So I teach people who are just new at this or don't cut a lot of mortises. So there's two ways that I prefer to have it to teach it. The first is to lay out your mortise and then just put some lines squared from your main, from the side of where your mortise will be. I only use one line as opposed to two. I like to work right up to that one line. So if I use a chisel that does not have sides that are square to the back, when you set them on this line, and the reason these lines are here is to help keep the side of your chisel parallel to this line, the long side of your mortise. Very difficult to just line this up by eye. I find if you put your chisel right on there, and it, if your chisel's built properly, then this is automatically going to be parallel to this line. When it's on an angle, then of course, every cut you make is going to be off, and it just screws up your whole mortise. If this one would, that has slopes on both sides, you're setting your chisel like so, you're not going to get a clean cut against this line because of course this chisel or this side is not square to the bottom. So it's going to be off and this one's going to be off. If you get a chisel that has square sides, parallel and square to the bottom, now every time you set your chisel on there and chop, this is going to remain parallel to that, and it's your best chance of getting a nice, clean wall on both sides of your mortise. Second way I teach it, sometimes folks don't have as steady a hand as they wish, so what we do is we put a block and clamp it in place. Now this would be clamped to the bench, edge, edge is squared up, set it right along there, and put a clamp on both sides. Now you can take your mortise chisel and hold it like this and go ahead and chop and that'll give you a nice clean wall on that side and because the chisel have parallel sides that are square to the back you're going to a nice parallel clean wall over here. If you're using one that does not have a square edge or sides that are square to the bottom every time you chop it's going to be aiming off into there moving this block on you and of course if you've got one that has slopes on both sides, that's not going to work out either. So your best bet is to buy mortise chisels that have sides that are parallel and square to the bottom. You get a nice clean mortise, whether you're chopping them by hand or whether you're using a guide block. So a beveled edge chisel means the bevel should be on the edge, not on the top. So you see this big wide square spot right here? If you're trying to chisel in between your tails and you got to get right into that corner, if you don't have the clearance over here, you're either going to have to come back afterwards and carefully carve it out, or you're going to risk bruising the side of your tail because that will not clear and get into that corner. So a bevel edge means you want to have the edge or the bevel come right down. You don't want to go all the way, then you're going to cut yourself. So there's a little bit of a flat landing right there, just enough to break that from being a, a knife edge. That's one thing to look for in chisels. Another one, which I think is equally as important, is the balance. If they are not balanced, if they don't feel good in your hand, you will not use them. Here's one of the worst examples. I bought these back in, 19, in the 1980s, and they were so clumsy in the hand. It just You'd be trying to chisel something, and this thing would be wobbling back and forth. It was so top-heavy. Worst chisel I think I ever bought. Something like this that fits in your hand nicely, is comfortable, it's just balanced perfectly. There's another one. This is one that we actually make, which feels really good in your hand. If it's not done properly from the ergonomic standpoint, you are not going to want to use it. So be careful when you're buying your chisels. Make sure you have the clearance on the side and feel them. Make sure they feel really comfortable and nicely balanced. Now this one, <laughs> they introduced some more controversy, but we're on a roll, so we'll keep going. And that's dovetail saws. If you're using a Japanese-style dovetail saw, there's a problem. 
when it comes to western hardwoods, these will not hold their shape. Here's what I mean. Your saw has to make a cut. Now I'm, I'm cutting a piece of hard maple that's a little better than an inch thick. And the best way to test the effectiveness of the saw is to make a cut as far into the wood as the saw will allow. Now remember, the idea in dovetails is you should be able to assemble right from your saw. You don't want to have to come in and start carving with a chisel. Now I'll cut this piece off. The surface left must be flat. You want it to be smooth as well, so that when you put it together, join to the other piece, there's no visible gap. Whether you turn it around that way, or whether you're coming up against the side of a pin this way, you want a nice flat surface that creates a really good glue joint. What you find with these, they're great with softwoods, but in hardwoods, that little thin blade only measures 12 thousandths of an inch, will wander and follow the path of least resistance. Now I did this, I used these for a while, but here's something else you notice too. These elongated teeth end up breaking off, and the next thing you know, you've got multiple teeth broken on your saw. So, if you're working western style hardwoods, these guys developed these saws years ago, hundreds of years ago. Stiff brass back, saw plate's relatively thin, it's only 20 thousandths of an inch, but being close to that stiff brass back keeps it nice and straight, that rip tooth is designed for cutting through these tough hardwoods and you end up with a nice, smooth, flat surface that will make a great joint. I teach a lot of people every year to cut dovetails. And there's some things that you can benefit from that just over time will work in your favor. And one of them, or the primary one that I'm speaking of is the shape of the handle. You can find what are called gent saws. They have a round turned handle. The problem with this is real simple. With your eyes closed or in a dark room, holding it in your hand, you have no idea where the blade is, which means you never are able to hold that in your hand and tell plumb 10 degrees left, 10 degrees to the right. On the other hand, no pun intended, if your saw has a shape that every time you pick it up, you grasp it the exact same way. You eventually learn where zero is, 10 degrees to the left, 10 degrees to the right. And in the process of learning to cut dovetails, every time you make a cut, you're reinforcing that ability to determine the angle or the plumb cut when you're working on your pins. So get a saw that has a shaped handle that will register, and every time you make a cut, you're investing in your skill. It'll pay huge dividends as you go down the roadways. Well, I said eight, but I decided to throw in a ninth, and that is a marking gauge. The traditional marking gauge, I haven't even got one, show you a picture of it, had a pin that came out of a wooden beam. The problem was that when you set it down, you no longer could see the pin. So if you were trying to stop, I have often told people, I said, if you want to avoid heavy gauge lines on your furniture, just scribe between the tails. Don't scribe right here, just in between there and there. Well, if you've got that old style, you're setting it down and you really don't know where it is as soon as you put it into the wood. This style, which, which is, has a round wheel, is so much easier. You can simply make your cut, roll it to go a little bit one way or the other, and you can be very precise with it. I ought to mention how much easier it is to sharpen. feels great in the hand, but the single biggest advantage is you can actually see the cutter engage the wood and stop and start exactly where you want. So there's nine tools that I uh, have purchased over the years that I wish I hadn't have, I wish I'd have saved the money and bought what I should have gotten, but I didn't know about it. So I'm sharing this information with you. Hopefully it'll help. Like I said, everybody has an opinion. You just heard mine. Do with it what you may. Either way, enjoy your woodworking. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.